Today, we're not just going to talk about mastering one track. We're actually going to be talking about mastering multiple tracks and how do we achieve that balance across an album. That's another big part of a mastering engineer's um, process. So we'll do all that in just a minute. Again, welcome everybody to the class. Thanks a lot for coming out. Wednesday, 1010 on your radio dial. And uh, we're going to do a little mastering here in Pro Tools, but today we are going to do multi-track mastering. So what I did yesterday, and you can see my project didn't save for some odd and unusual reason. Actually, I think we went through the session file backups. Let's see if I have that in there. Let's see if that can work. Yeah, hey, there we go. That's better. How about that? All right. So this is what we discussed yesterday. Um, so basically, um, a mastering engineer's job is not to remix a project, to take the individual tracks of every instrument and voice and create something bigger and better. It's to take what the mixing engineer did and make it industry standard, ready for distribution, ready for streaming, ready for CD duplication, ready for movie, ready for whatever destination that track is going to. So you could see here on track number one, we took a audio file that was mixed by an engineer and we listened to it. And we took a look at a bunch of things like, what does the track look like? What does the track sound like? What are the details of things like the uh, VU meter? Uh, what's going through here? What's, what's the eventual thought process of this? Now, what we're hearing, even though you're seeing the run master here, and I can actually hide that if you'd like. We'll just pop this bad boy out and do the mat, get rid of the master track. Um, but what we're looking at here is basically the mix channel and what the eventual sound is going to be. So you could see that right now we're only at about negative 8.5, right? And so even in our master, that's kind of mirroring and showing you the back and forth. So here's something very interesting. Um, and, I, and again, this goes back to our metering VU algorithms set up in Pro Tools. Let's look at the differences really quick because we went over this very quickly at the end of the class yesterday, but I want to kind of harp on that a little bit. So if you look at the track itself, it's hovering right around negative 20 dB, right? Now, if you look at the master, it's kind of in between about, you know, 13, 12 dB, negative 13, negative 12 dB on the VU scale. Then down here, we're getting a different number, right? We can actually click on this and get a little better. But negative 7, well, it's certainly not going to negative 7 here, right? We're not even close to negative 7. We'd be up around here somewhere. So what we're looking at is different ways that this software can monitor and show you visually levels of a track. All right. So our negative 20 here is pretty good. And our master track is around negative six, which actually probably is more accurate. Right. So what we did yesterday is actually we went into the Pro Tools preferences and I got to stop the playback here really quick. We went into the Pro Tools preferences and looked at metering. And so we, these are the areas in which you can show different uh, options and parameters for metering. So if you look at this right here, which says track and master meter types. All right, the track meters are in digital VU algorithm, whereas the master meters are in Pro Tools Classic. So that is exactly why they look different. Not so much in the numbers that they're showing, but in the total volume when you push play. And that's what's really strange is that we're only seeing about negative 20 on average for our mix track, but our master track is hovering right around that you know, negative 6.6 .6 area. Now, we can even these out if we really feel it necessary. We can actually make them the same exact thing, right? We can go ahead and hit that and then hit OK. And then you could see the scale here change. You see the view meter change. So now when I push play, they look exactly the same. So why wouldn't you do that? Well, I mean, because you don't necessarily always need to have the same view meters if you know what you're looking at. And to be honest with you, I grew up with Pro Tools back in Pro Tools version 4 or 5 by always monitoring my master as a Pro Tools classic. And I hit OK again. You can see that the view meter scale changed. But again, it's irrelevant. It's just showing you numbers. In the end, you know you want to get as close to negative 6 to 0 as possible on average. You want to get it to sound really loud. And that's, again, part of the mastering engineer's job. So yesterday, what we did in order to achieve that goal is we started adding inserts to the master track. We use things like EQ and Pro Tools' really awesome uh, dynamic 
compressor, limiter, maximizer called Maxim. So let's build that signal chain again. We're gonna use our EQ7 that we're not gonna to touch right now. And then of course, we're gonna use our dynamics and we'll go down to Maxim. Maxim is unbelievably awesome. And to get to that next level, what we did was we push play and we allowed the software to kind of look at a bunch of things. Now you can see there's a, a lot of stuff going on now because we activated that Maxim plugin. Um, and did I undo something here? Hold on, let me just see this right. Do, do, do. Yes, we undid this by accident. Okay, there we go. So in our Maxim plugin now, and we'll go back to our, there we go. We'll reset that. We're gonna notice a couple things happen. So when I push play, right, the input of the mix track, which is right here, is showing you its range. The output is pretty much the same, as you can see. So whatever's going in is going out. So really, we're not making any changes in this plugin. I talked about dropping the ceiling to about negative 0.1, which is a, like, a place I like to be because it never risks any uh, overs, even though this is a hard limiter. Um, even at zero dB, there's sometimes things that can pop a little bit and cause distortion. So just to be safe, I throw it in as a negative 0.1. The difference between negative 0.1 and zero is nothing when you listen to it, but it means something digitally when you're talking about things that could distort. So then we also took our threshold parameter here and we started dropping it down until it reached the very tip of this histogram. So right down here. So basically what I'm doing is all of this space in here is an area where I can increase the volume. So I'm gonna go ahead and keep pushing it down until I see, you see it gets orange like that. I'm gonna do it until I get the very tip or so orange, all right? So by doing that, what I've done is increase total volume. Now let's take a look at the mix track and the master track and look at that. It is really loud now. And I have the music pushed down way, way down, right? I have the music pushed way down. So just to hear it in terms of what it sounds like through the microphone into your speakers on whatever device you're listening to, here is, uh, we'll, we'll kind of bypass this for first. So this is what it sounds like without the Maxim plugin. Right, and here's what it sounds like with the Maxim plugin on it. Without. With. Now we said we didn't touch the EQ right away because when we increased volume, we actually increased volume across the entire spectrum of 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. And what that could do is actually have some of the frequencies that were kind of buried in there to jump out a little bit. So we wanna now go back to the EQ and start kind of looking at what needs to be fixed. And we're gonna use our ears to do this since Pro Tools doesn't have a great analyzer, like you don't see the visualizer in the frequencies here. Um, so we're just gonna have to use our ears or we can use another plugin, you know, a third party plugin that has a visualizer. We looked at o uh, uh, Ozone yesterday and that showed us a visualizer, but we're just gonna do it like, you know, by the ear. And with this, we find that there are some parts of the high end that are really loud. So I can kind of roll off a little bit of the high end. And we also found that we lost a little bit of that kick and bass. So we're going to go down into the 100 to 200 area, and we're going to go ahead and push that up just a little bit. Good. So now I, a, little, a little bit of the toms now comes through. The uh, cymbals and the guitar aren't screeching through. And so, again, here was the result. I'll turn it up for you. So that's without, and here's with. Without. And that's the end of the song. So you can see just, just the Maxim plugin, what that can add to a mastering session is unbelievable. And it's a little different in how we've been working, right? We've really been working with EQ, then compression. In this case, we put the EQ down, but we add the maximizer dynamic compression and then go backwards to listen to the EQ to try to see if anything, when we did maximize it, is a little too bright, is not as linear as it was with the initial mix, um, but we are getting a huge amount of volume out of this. Um, so 
really quick, I'm just going to bypass these because I want to bring back the result of our mastering yesterday. So once we did all of that work, that EQ and Maximizer, we then bounced the track to a brand new wave file. Look at the difference between the mixed track here and then the master track. Look how much louder it is. Look how much more consistent it is from start to finish. It's just showing you that how much just two simple plugins made a big difference in this. We're soloing, this is the master version. And you can see on that one, I actually pushed it to zero. It did at one point um, peak out. But again, with a careful ear, I was listening to it saying, do I hear a distortion? Do I want that to feel like really loud and really dirty in the speakers? And I went to a bunch of different environments to really make sure that what I was doing was the right direction. So I would burn this, I would bring it to my car, I'd put it on my iPhone and listen to it through my headphones. I'd throw it through a small Bluetooth speaker in the house, I'd play it through the television, I'd play it through an Alexa. You know, you want to make sure that all the environments still stand up when this track is done. And it did. Uh, this entire session worked very well. Now, I say this entire session because today I did say we were going to talk about multi-track mastering. So let's do that. Let's get rid of this run master for a minute. I want to get rid of this track. So we'll delete this track for now. We don't need it. And we're going to work solely in mixed tracks. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to um, take this and uh, let me just zoom a little further. There we go. I'm going to take this track and leave it where it is. And I'm going to add a brand new track to it. Let me come over to my, this was run, right? So we'll use cars. And we'll go back to my cars mix. And we'll throw that bad boy in here as well. And so what I'll do actually is I'll put it right at the back end of this one. So we kind of do like a back and forth checkerboard kind of concept. Now, these songs are all on the same album. So one of the other things the mixing engineer's job is to make sure that if all these tracks appear on a single album together, that they have consistency from start to finish. Now, sometimes... When we do add the EQ and Maxim plugin like we have here, it works out great. There's not much to do. The mixing engineer did a good job on keeping everything consistent throughout from track to track, right? So when this track ends, all right, and then I'll wait for that to go out. And I'll maybe bring cars in just a little bit for like the next track on the album. All right, and now what I'm doing is I'm seeing if from track one to track two, volume, EQ, compression, Maxim plugin, all are working and doing the same things, right? Obviously, it's a little skit before the uh, song. So what I would do is probably use my cursor in A and B, and I'll go back from this one over to this one. But here, here's the song kicking in. Let's see how consistent it is from that track to this track. So, so far, I think volume is good. Uh, I am feeling like that guitar is uh, screeching through the mix a little bit. So I'm still going to keep this right now. And I did already kind of create a cut in the low and the high end rather, just to kind of, I don't know, keep those really wild high frequencies from busting through. But I'm just going to quickly A and B to make sure I'm on the right track here. Yeah, and I find even though that's a higher pitched note, I feel like it needs a little more control when you want to go from track one to track two to track three to sound more consistent. So now I'll come in and instead of playing with this again, because if I do this, if I fix this, I've offset the first track. I'm going to go into my second track directly on the track and I'm going to do an additional EQ move, which could allow me to um, really address that high frequency guitar. Now, in this case, um, because I want a visualizer to see what frequency that guitar is in, I'm actually going to use solely use the Ozone 8 equalizer. 
Okay, so we're gonna put that on. We're gonna push play, and now I got the visualizer here in Ozone, uh, which allows me then to look at the uh, spectrum between 20 hertz and 20 kilohertz and try to find that guitar in there that's really screeching through. It's actually right here. You can see it's right there. And there's a couple of harmonic uh, steps there with it. There it is. It's right here. It's right here. And it really it, it needs to be addressed just a little bit. Maybe like a two decibel pull down. Nothing crazy. And maybe I widen that out just a little bit, you know, just so I'm covering everything so it doesn't sound like just that frequency band is gone. Let's go back to the track. And let's rewind it where it starts, which is right here. And let's play it down. Let's see if I've done a better job uh, getting that frequency of that guitar to kind of match with the frequency of the guitar back in track one. I already can tell there's a difference. Okay. And then here's the first track and the guitar coming in. Okay, so it really does cut through. That's good. And let's see how much this is now. And it is better now. And you can see, look at those four harmonic steps here. One, two, three, four. You can see it as they drop. So I could actually move this over just a little bit. And, you know, one and a half decibels is fine just to kind of clamp it a little bit, to pull it back a little bit because it was really screeching through the mix. And it's something that you don't want certain parts of certain songs to sound different than others. Again, not to say that that's the exact same guitar. It's probably not the same pedal. It's definitely not the same key. It might even be a different amplifier or a different guitar. Um, but I'm talking about in how it's playing off the rest of the song. That really means like taking this music in, this information in, and kind of breaking it down in your mind, okay? So here, where's the drums? Where's the bass in the mix? And then how is that guitar sitting with the rest of the instruments? In this case, I can hear everything pretty individually. So I want to hear that same thing here. And I'm pretty good now. See, the, the guitar isn't, quote unquote, overpowering anything else in the mix. I still hear the drums clear. I still hear the bass. So we are actually in a, a pretty good spot here. So again, what I did was I took my first track and I built my uh, mastering chain here, my EQ and my Maxim plugin uh, to get that volume. Then once I introduced my second track, now I have to go back to the track itself to make any balancing adjustments based upon the first track or other tracks that may come before or after it. So this is all like a game that you're playing. You're kind of going in and, and making sure things, oh, there's an updater. Ooh, well, that didn't work. Um, so Ozone uh, for me, for like EQ here, because we don't have a visualizer in any of the Pro Tools EQs, this one works great um, because it allows you to see the frequencies and then address them based upon visual elements as opposed to you just listening and guessing. You know, Sound Gym was supposed to help you eventually get better ears to hear that. You know, when I would hear that song, I would say it's probably between 2 and 5K, and then I could narrow it down. But as we play it back here in the Visualize, you can actually see that's between, right, the first one is here, the first harmony is here, then the other one's right around there, and then the other one is creeping up around here around the 5K range. So we actually are uh, right on target to address that particular signal. I could actually make this a little narrower, Really, we know it's not happening below 2K, so why roll that off? And we know it's not happening above 5, so we can really, you know, adjust this just a little bit so we're pulling down more of the frequencies that we want to address and control than applying it to other frequencies that have nothing to do with what we're trying to do. You know, you don't want to pull down frequencies that have nothing to do with the type of move you're looking to make. All right, so again, we built our, Mac, uh, our mastering chain here in Pro Tools. We then balanced it using the first track. I, call, I, call, I usually call that my initial reference track, initial reference track, not just a reference track, but an initial reference track. And then once I add the second track to my mix, as you see here, I then create a balance. But in order to do that, I'll have to go back to the track itself, not just sit here and change it again. 
that would be silly. Why would you keep going back and changing the master track settings every single time? Now, again, this is all based upon whether the mixing engineer actually did their job because the mixing engineer had a big, big say in how this is going to feel in the end because they initially mixed it. And so those tracks should be consistent when you get them uh, mixed down and sent to you in WAV files. You know, if it's not consistent, what, what are we doing here? I'm just going to save this really quick as our original project. Boom. And we'll replace it because we did some extra moves here and I don't want to lose it because I'm going to pull my eye lock for a moment. And I'm actually going to bring in a third track. Yes. Ooh, scary. I'm going to bring in a third track. So let's go into our um, external drive here and pull in the other tracks that were part of this album or this session. So this, I think it was five songs, if I'm not mistaken. We'll see when we get in there. So now the, the next step is to get the third track to sound just as good as the first two. And then the fourth track to sound as good as the first three. Again, you're building this consistency across the entire album or project. So let's go into our uh, Pro Tools projects. And it is called Frankenblazer. There it is. And then uh, here's a couple of days. This is the DV mix of that song. And uh, Severian. And I think that was it. All right. So it was four, four songs on the album. All right. And we'll pull these into the master folder. We could dump this out of here because I don't want to have the hard drive sitting on top of me. Pull these guys into the master folder. And then what we can do is bring them into our project. Now, in some cases, there's a lot of engineers that like to checkerboard this, right? You like to do every other track. So you have an A track and a B track. And I really do like that, um, you know, compared to what people are doing. Um, I prefer that if I'm not quite sure how the mixing engineer ended up doing this or if they did it correctly, uh, I would end up putting every single song of the album on its own track. Let me plug that in for us. So now iLock can be there again. Come on, recognize it. <laughs> uh, well, we'll have to save and maybe it'll quit out on us. Yeah, it did. That's fine. That's because I pulled my thing. So, but we can go back in there. So we're going to pull in the other two songs. This was a couple of days. And then we're going to pull in Subherban. Subherban. Subherban? Subherban? I don't even know what that is. Just the name of the song, right? And there we go. Restoring all my settings. Bringing back my master session. All right. Good. And now, so we'll come over here and we'll drag these bad boys right into the project. And like I said, instead of uh, possibly doing only two tracks and staggering back and forth, um, I was unfamiliar of the mixing engineer. I uh, know I take that back. I do know the mixing engineer, but let's just say I was unfamiliar with the mixing engineer, right? So I want to make sure that a, the changes I make to each track are individualized because I'm not quite sure how they were how they mix this or, you know, what the end all and be all was. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put every single track on its own track. Uh, we'll go back down the medium so you can see them all. Oh, maybe not. Let's go a little smaller. Oh, well, that's why. There we go. There we go. So now you can see here's track one, track two, track three, track four. So again, we listened to track two and we made the necessary adjustments. So now let's go down to track number uh, three. So track three, let's uh, hear the back end of this and then see how that feeds into this song. We'll do that just like this. All right. So now here comes track three into the mix. All 
right. So I don't think it's all that bad. I think at one point here, the guitar at the very beginning sounds a little dirty. Let's see what we can find out by looking at it in the EQ. Um, oh, I didn't want to put the whole plugin on there. Whoops. The EQ Ozone. I want to look at it in the visualizer just because, again, I'm working on a laptop speaker. So for me, this isn't technically how I would really ever um, monitor when mixing. So I would end up uh, putting on headphones or going back to a studio or my studio upstairs and, and listen to it through speakers that are a little more tuned for, um, you know, studio level quality. Let's take a look at the visualizer of the third track and just see if there's any inconsistencies throughout. Low end looks good. It looks a little hot here in the mid. Let me see what happens if I pull this down and just widen that out a little bit. I mean, it's not terrible. I, and it's not crazy. Um, I don't mind what's going on here. These little changes that I made, uh, about one or two decibels, are making a very small impact on the uh, actual level. Uh, what my concern was was back here, right? It just feels a little sucked in. And then here, it's very wide. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I want to, again, trying to create consistency from point A to point B here is really the goal. And this has actually a lot more low end than the other track. Again, just to hear the balance out, I'd then come back in here and listen to this part. So that track, I think, was recorded differently. And you see this one sounds good. And then this one. So that balance is actually really good. So maybe I have to go back now to my balance of this one and add more low end. Let's take a look at the low end of this track. And it's not terrible. We really didn't do anything wrong. It's just how it was recorded. And of course, it probably has a lot to do with the type of song it is. And, you know, it's in a cover song of uh, an 80s song, I believe, right? The cars here in my car. Maybe in the 70s, late 70s. Um, so yeah, the uh, the two tracks here, track um, let's see three, right, and track two are very different, especially when comparing even to track one. Um, so if I was a mastering engineer preparing for this, what I want to do probably is I would take this track and I would make it track two, because I feel like it's more consistent um, when listening to this album straight through that it makes a lot more sense. Plus usually cover songs are, are a lot of times buried in the back end of an album anyway. And with that said, let's move then this track up. Cause this I think was an original as well. And we'll make the, the second track before now be the fourth track. And this is part of the process. This is part of what you're doing as a mastering engineer is kind of trying to make some decisions for the band and helping the producer put this all together. Um, yeah. The band's going to want their input on track order, but you can explain it to them just the way I'm explaining to you that, all right, well, the song that you record that's a cover song kind of sounds a lot different than your consistent songs uh, of original content in the album. So what I would do if I were you guys is I would put your uh, original songs like this one. And then and that sounds pretty even. And so this one and its loudest parts sounds consistent as well. So I know we're doing the right thing here by saying track one, track two, track three. So they all sound pretty consistent levels when everything's in there, all the bands playing, the singers singing. Um, it does have that very consistent sound throughout. And then once you get down to this, where they weren't playing like original song music, they were trying to cover a song, we can then introduce this as the last thing. And people won't think as hard as, wow, that song really stands out because it doesn't sound like the other three, right? And obviously because it's a cover song too. But it was just produced differently. It was made differently. 
All right. So now that I've made my order up, just based upon, like I said, opinionated ideas of how things should go, again, I'm going to go back through and just A and B everything, make sure that each one that I have here is exactly the way I want it. So this is the first one. I like that. I like that. And now we didn't get into uh, Subherban. So let's, uh, do, 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 do. let's add our ozone into this guy just to take a look at it visually. Looks pretty good. I might, I, I just might on this one because that, that, nah, maybe not, maybe not. Let me listen to it when it really kicks in here. This would be the better dis, uh, way of deciding what needs to get done. There we go. Yeah, so that area right here around that 2K range is really pumping. You can see it just really creeping right in there. The rest of this is pretty good. And then this one. Yeah, there we go. So that's what I was looking for. See, when the whole band is playing and the, and the vocalist is doing his thing, I want it to sound consistent. Now that seems like it has a little more high end in it now that I'm listening to it. Maybe I just creep out that high end just a little bit more. Yep. Perfect. And this one too then, just a little bit. Nothing crazy, just a little like, you know, half a decibel pull down on the high end just to control things. Yep. Perfect. It almost sounds like all three clips I just did came from the same song. And that's the point. You want it to sound consistent in regards to the quality, the frequency balance, the volume, everything from start to finish. What makes a good album is the fact that you can go from track to track and go, yeah, that, that was it, you know? And then we can also then come back into the, the last track and just see if there's anything else there that needs to be adjusted now based on what I just did on the first three. So this one, I, I, I was going to say before, the stereo field doesn't sound as good as the other ones. This sounds very centered with a little bit of that high end and, and cymbals and stuff that should be panned out left and right. And then you get into this and... That guitar, though overpowering, is so wide in the stereo field. So there's a way we can go ahead and look at that. We looked at that visualization um, yesterday. Uh, Isotope has a imager. And so the imager actually can show us what it's supposed to look like in the stereo field from left to right. This is another step that mastering engineers need to take. They need to take a listen to um, all the tracks and see how the stereo field plays out. So let's take a look at it, what it is. So these are just different ways of looking at it. You can look at it like white noise, or you can look at it in terms of things that are really centered and things that are off to the left and right here. So here's what I'm going to do. Instead of just putting it on this track, what I'm going to do is I'm not going to put the imager over here on the master track. All right, so now we can look at all four tracks and how they stack up against each other when the imager is running. So we'll leave it in the polar for now. Let's take a look at this guy. Let's see how it works. All right, so there's that track. Let's see what this one looks like. Very similar, right? Let's take a listen to this one. Okay, very similar. And then when we get to this one, and it's not terribly off, but I feel like there's not as much stereo information, right? You see, it's not as wide as the other ones were. Again, I'll go back to this. And then this one. It's not terrible. Uh, again, for you guys to hear it through this microphone isn't exactly going to work correctly. So that's why I bring up the visualization part because then you can kind of see the differences as opposed to hearing the differences. But I actually, at this point, see a small difference, but don't hear a huge difference. All right, and here's another step as a mastering engineer you probably should take, listening to everything in mono. 
So again, your speakers and your phones have gotten a lot better. It used to be a mono speaker and now it's a stereo speaker. Now they put them on both the top and the bottom of the phones. And so you're listening to pretty much stereo sound out of phones now. Um, but there are other devices in our world that aren't stereo. And again, as a consistency meter and what you want to check as a mastering engineer is that this song sounds good no matter where you put it. To do that, what I always do is I always fold it down to mono to see what it sounds like. Now, I wouldn't put the tracks into mono. I wouldn't go in and change these all to mono tracks just to see. What I'm doing here is using the visualizer to kind of fold it down to mono. So a plug-in on the master track. So now both left and right are very consistent. Let's take a listen to all three again, and let's see how it stacks up in mono. And you can see right now the visualizer is showing a mono bar straight ahead, no stereo information. Let's see how this one looks. Oops. Pretty good, about even. Let's see this next one. Like it. Levels are good. And now let's do it over here in the cars. And I like that too. Uh, I think all of that looks great. So I'm actually pretty happy that when I pull it out of that, uh, listening to things in stereo through your headphones or through speakers, that there's still some sort of consistency throughout. Something didn't fall off, even though we went to a mono environment. And now it sounds big and full. And there's mono. And here's stereo. I'll switch it back and forth so you can hear it a little better. So here's stereo. Here's mono. Stereo, mono. And like I said, you know, obviously the difference in stereo and mono is big, but when you look at what the tracks all are doing in both stereo alone and then both all four of them in mono alone, you want to make sure that, again, there's consistency from start to finish. That's another step I always take during the mastering process. Let me just save this project so we don't lose it. Um, so what I'm going to do is, uh, and what we did yesterday, just to give you a uh, review, is that we not only used the EQ and the Maxim plugin yesterday, but what we also did was take a look at uh, Isotope's Ozium, uh, sorry, Ozium, uh, Ozone, not Ozium, Ozone, um, ba -ba 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 -ba. The entire Ozone 8 uh, plugin suite. So you'll see that right away you can see your EQ, but this also includes dynamics and a maximizer. And a maximizer is exactly what maxim is, right? We drop that below negative one. We found that if we dropped to about negative 10 or so, we're going to get a very similar result. So playing it like this gives us back to that negative one threshold. And again, another nice, loud result. So my, my point to that was we don't necessarily need to buy Ozone 8 at $300 or whatever it costs to get it. Maybe it's $199 now or something like that. We can actually build very similar things just using the plugins that Pro Tools given us. Again, what we're always doing is looking at the VU meter, making sure that the levels that we're getting are consistent from start to finish, track to track. You can see that there. Looks great. And so now the last step, once we've achieved all of this, is the exportation process. And see, this is where people start to get tripped up a little bit because if we bounce the project as it is, we're going to get one audio file that represents all four tracks. And that's not necessarily bad. You know, we can do that. I don't have a problem with that. So let's take you through the whole process here really fast. Back to the beginning. Let's highlight them all. Let's do a bounce to disk. And let's take a look at our settings. So as I said to you, we started our project uh, yesterday with a 24-bit, 48 kilohertz sample rate, right? So our wave files, interleave, 24, 48, that's the way it's going to go out. Whatever we brought it in as is the way it's going to go out. Um, we'll just put FB for Franklin Blazer, right? And of course, it's going to go in our bounce files. And we're going to do an offline bounce. So one of the questions, again, going back to the Project 9, Project 9A questions you were supposed to be doing, what's the difference between an online and an offline bounce? Well, here's a great opportunity to show you. If we don't check offline and we hit bounce, 
we're actually going to now run the entire album live. It's going to do a complete bounce during playback. So it's going to take the entire time it takes to play this entire four tracks to bounce. Now, that's awesome because for a ma mastering engineer, you kind of want to listen to the whole thing anyway at one point. But the problem is if I find an issue or something that needs to change during this offline bounce, I have to stop it. I have to make the fix and then I have to start it again, which now adds another 14 minutes to your project. So I do like uh, offline bouncing. I do. It's, it's what I usually use, but there is some merit and there is some value in doing an online bounce. We're not going to do that right now. We're going to do an offline bounce. We'll do offline bounce to this time. We'll do this. Uh, all the settings are good. We're going to choose. And so it's going to take, you know, probably about a 10th of the time. And so for a 14 minute, um, project, it probably should take somewhere around a minute 40 or so. Um, and with that said, that minute and 40, we're actually going to get a file in our project. As you remember, when we were talking about the way uh, Pro Tools and Logic builds their uh, project folders, um, I specifically bounced it into the bounced folders. So when this is done, this file will be accessible. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take that file and I'm going to bring it back into the project. Now, this is one way of many ways we can do what we were talking about, and that's create your final bounces, right? I didn't do an individual bounce of each track. I didn't do that. I bounced the entire project straight through just to show you one way. So then I bring that project back into the session. And there it is. I'm actually going to put it down here below this one. Good. There we go. And you can see now that these four tracks are now represented by one big long session. Look at the difference. I mean, just look at the difference in volume. We'll go down here to this last track. Look at the difference of what we did just simply using an EQ and the Maxim plugin. That's it, man. I mean, it looks phenomenal and it's going to sound good. It's going to get us to that next level. Now, obviously, I didn't spend a lot of time meticulously going through track by track like I really would. This did not represent the amount of time I usually would spend creating the project. Um, but it's, a, again, a, a nice place to be because you can see there's consistency from track one to track two to track three to track four. Just visually, you can see it's consistent, right? The volume is high. It's much higher than the original mix. So now the next step is to create individual tracks. So that's why we're going to go in and create our cuts. We'll do our little snip snip right here. Let me get back into my um, multi-tool here, my smart tool. I'm just going to create a little, little sliver here so we can make a cut. And so now I have this track. Uh, let's see where we go here. Well, now it's actually going through the master, so we don't want to do that. Don't want to have the master track now affecting plugins. There we go. Okay, so now I feel like uh, the, the symbol is still kind of ringing out a little bit here. So what I'll probably end up doing is just putting a touch of a fade here. Let's go back to the beginning and see if there's anything that needs to be done there. Yep, I'm going to make a little cut here because I do not want any of that. I want to start literally right away. When I push play on the track, that's what I want to hear. So I'm, I'm right now tailoring that track to be exactly what I want it to be. So I want to be exactly starting on the first waveform. It can possibly go. Uh, um, so let me get back into, because I have it into loop, back to my standard trim tool here. What are we doing here? Come on, loop tool. Well, I'll just do that. And then uh, on the back end, I said I, I feel like the symbols went out a little more. So I added that last little fade. Now I'm going to take a listen to that fade and make sure it's exactly what I want. Good, it, trail, it, it drops off exactly. So now this track not only was mastered, um, and we'll go back into my smart tool here, push my F, F buttons. Oh, they're not set up. Um, so I'm going to take my track. It's exactly what I want. This is what's going to represent now the file I send out. Either the file that's going to get bounced 
or the file that's going to uh, go for out on streaming distribution. So now um, I can actually go in if I wanted to a couple of different ways and save this cut of this file right there. So you can see FB0102. I have FB01 as its file right here. So if I right click on that, I can export it as its own file. So I'm gonna export that as a WAV file again, 24, we'll keep it at 48. For some reason it wanted to go backwards. We're gonna choose, and what was the initial? I think this was called run. So we're gonna head and make sure we're good here for master audio files, let's choose. I'm gonna make a new folder within my project that's gonna be called masters. Okay, and I'm gonna hit open. And of course I'm going to uh, prompt for each duplicate export. Let's take a look at what it looks like over here. In my masters, I have FB01 left and right. So you know what, I didn't do my interleaving. So we'll delete that because that's not useful at all. Let's go back into here and Come on, we're gonna export the clip again. This time we're going to make sure we interleave. And there we go, interleaved. So again, WAV file interleave 2448. I uh, chose my destination as being my masters. Yep, good, all right, so I'll hit open. We'll export there, go back to my file and there's FB01 as a mastered file. I'm gonna rename it as run and there we go. Now there's other information I could put into this in a mastering based software. You can actually type in metadata. You can type in things like the artist name, the album, the date created, the producer information. Uh, there's a lot of data that can be put into there. Let's do the second one really quick. Um, of course, I already have the start end of the second one here. Let's just make sure I don't have just extra uh, sound there for no reason. So let's, uh, well, I, I skipped it pretty quick here. Here it is. Uh, let's see here. So it's just some, there's some just nonsensical sound there. Let's, let's trim that back. And then let's add a tiny little fade there at the very beginning. So it smoothly transitions right into it. Perfect. Okay. So let's go to the back end and let's make our cut to make sure we know we got what we got. Let's listen to it. Okay, so right there, I start hearing a little bit of the, the machine noise. Again, I'm gonna add just a tiny little fade there so it goes right out. Out, perfect. All right, good. So we're happy with the front and back end and the trim and length of this track. I'll then click on it. I'll come over here. And I will right click and I'll export those clips as files. Again, wave file interleave 2448. I'm gonna make sure it's in my directory. We'll export that. And then this one was called what? Um, I do not recall. Oh, day, couple of days. Okay, so we'll go over here. We'll rename it a couple of days. And there's my couple of days mastered. Go back into the software. Check out the front and back end of the next track, which is Suburban. Let's do our little trim here, make sure we don't miss anything. Okay, that's good. Happy with that, so I'll do a quick little fade here. And then I'll go to the back end of this track. Choo, choo, choo. I know, well, if I keep zooming out and zooming back in, it's just so erratic. It's so sensitive for some reason. I gotta change my mouse settings at one point. Um, okay, cool. So let's, uh, let's cut in here and let's hear what this is. So there's a little bit of trail out there. So I want to make sure that whatever I do, I don't interrupt the actual trail out, which actually happens somewhere in there. So let's do that again. There we go. Nice smooth out. Let me come in a little bit more here. Okay. I'm good with that. So now this track is ready for exporting. So we'll click on it. We'll go over here. I'm going to right click and export and everything looks good there. Everything looks good there. This one was called Suburban. So we'll come in here and we'll rename it Suburban. All right. And the last one was Cars. So let's just go into Cars really quick. Let's trim this back. 
I think it starts right around there. We'll pull a little fade in just to smooth transition it. There we go. And we'll go to the back end and make sure we don't cut anything off we don't want to have or want to have. So I'm looking for that last moment where it's gone. And there it is right there. So I'll bring this into that. I'll again, put a small little thing here. So once it's fall, fallen be below the threshold, I wanna make sure I get out so I don't hear any system noise. So I'm still a little short here. Might wanna come in just a little more. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then uh, let's do this. I think we're good there. I can put my manual fade in. Look at that, magic. If you recall that, that was me highlighting. Command F fades it. Listen to it again, make sure I'm good. And there it goes, it's out. All right, so highlight that track. Coming in here to this, right click on there, export file as, export it up. And now the last one here is cars. All right, so there we go. We have our four mastered tracks. These four tracks are now 100% mastered. I'm going to save this project and quit out. And now my last step I would do is just now go into this and listen into it in another software. In this case, I'll just use QuickTime. And we'll just take a listen through it through our speakers. Put our speakers up to where they're supposed to be. Make sure everything is exactly what it's supposed to be. All right, that sounds pretty good. Sounds pretty good there. I'm just spot checking. <coughs> Starts exactly the way I want it to start. Go in here. Good. And it ends exactly the way I wanted to do it. Again, just spot checking it, quality control, making sure everything I'm doing is right. Perfect there. <coughs> good there. And I'm good in there. So I think we're good with run. And then I'll check uh, Suburban. Good, and let's play it, thank you. Hey, listen, I think I got four mastered tracks right here. Now, again, I didn't spend the amount of time I typically would spend on these tracks, uh, but that quick, within an hour, I just mastered four tracks. Four tracks, all of which are gonna be on an album, exactly the way they wanted them. Here you go, pay me. I took it from a level where I got it, which was good, to a level that I sent out that was industry standard. Again, with not spending a lot of time. I, again, I know I'm doing things very fast and I, and I would not spend this little time on it. Probably spend about an hour per track perfecting it, which is what I think I did. Um, but in the end, your results are staggering. Anyone who I've ever mastered something for goes, holy crap, how did you get it to sound like that? Simple steps, baby, knowing your software, knowing how to treat things, knowing how to balance things, knowing how to compare A and B and what goes where and what goes here. Very, very simple things you can do. And you can take those productions and those mixes to the next level with minimal work. Just some basic tools and a little bit of know-how. All right, we'll stop there. I didn't realize it was 11 o'clock already. I love mastering, so I can go on for a while. We'll pick up tomorrow talking a little bit about logic. Uh, anybody have any questions about anything, what happened or anything that happened throughout the lesson today? You can always email me throughout a day. And of course, this lesson will be up on YouTube at you know somewhere around 12 o'clock, maybe even a little earlier. So if you want to go back through it and watch it, and you always have it as a reference for the future, you can always come back uh, a year from now after you've been doing stuff in uh, school or, or in college and go, oh, how did I, how am I supposed to master this? Okay, here, here it is. You're sitting at home one day when, ah, oh, I got a track. I want to master it. Boom, it's up there. Always there for you as a reference. I am the king of free information. All right, no questions? Cool. All right, guys. So listen, uh, make sure you're working on project number 11 and make sure you're getting that math assignment done. And of course, on Friday, we will have a quiz on mastering. Be sure to go back and watch the videos if you missed something. We will also go over the questions tomorrow. And uh, yeah, that's it. All right. You all have yourselves a great, beautiful day. We'll see you tomorrow, 10 a.m. right here and the Zoom chat. Have a great day, everybody. We out.